Hey, welcome to the Vanguard Podcast. I'm Gavin. And I'm Zach. And we've just been joined by Lieutenant Governor of Vermont, uh, David Zuckerman. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we wanted to talk to you because you've recently won the Democratic primary in uh, Vermont for governor. And you're now going on to face the incumbent Republican in November. How's it going? Well, it's going well. It's, uh, you know, these kinds of campaigns are exhausting. They're nonstop. I happen to also have an organic vegetable pork and chicken farm. So it's, uh, you know, farming season. I've got a great crew and my spouse uh, co-runs. And I'd say these days is mostly running the farm, far more than me. Uh, but it's going well. Uh, the governor has done a reasonably good job with COVID, but he's also in the past couple of years vetoed minimum wage increases, paid family leave, a bill to acquire uh, chemical and companies that release toxic chemicals into the groundwater and others to uh, monitor the health of people that were exposed. So, you know, he's vetoed a number of bills that um, a lot of Vermonters would support. And so it's going to be an interesting dynamic of trying to remind folks that while we're in the midst of COVID and have to deal with COVID, that we also have to be looking forward at how we're going to rebuild the economy, how working people and essential workers deserve fair wages, what we're going to do about affordable housing, what we're going to do about broadband, what we're going to do about the climate, which is, you know, in some ways benefited from COVID while people are driving all over the place. We've seen smog over cities disappear. But the reality is the fundamentals that are destroying the climate are all still there. And, uh, you know, we've got to do both. We've got to rub our belly and tap our head at the same time. We've got to resolve and make people, you know, safe and healthy through COVID and be working towards the future. And that's going to be the debate through the fall with this governor. Yeah, well, um, you've been a lieutenant governor, you know, through these unprecedented times. And uh, obviously that doesn't wield as much power as the governor, but as COVID has swept the nation, what's it like been in, being in a position of governance? And um, how would your response to the pandemic, you know, differ if you're elected than the current governor? Well, in some ways, actually, Vermont has done better than almost any other state in the country. And I think the people of Vermont deserve a lot of credit for that. The geographic lay of the land, which is that we don't have any major city. And when you look at where COVID was worse, it was places with major dense populations. And then the other factor where we're seeing it spread now is populations that are cavalier about the realities of COVID and the science of transmitting it and not wearing masks. Well, in Vermont, we have a very um, conscious community that was wearing masks and spacing well. We don't have a major city. And the governor, to his credit, took good actions early to say, let's shut down large events and, and group events that are indoors. So um, there's not a lot I would change in that regard. Uh, as we get into the fall and schools opening up, I think there's been really poor guidance by the state with respect to the medical and scientific guidance for our schools. You know, teachers, school boards, principals, they're not epidemiologists and infectious disease specialists. And they really didn't get the clear guidance they needed in order to open. Uh, there's also were major issues back in the day with our unemployment system that I think could have and should have been resolved earlier. Uh, the governor finally did something two days after I wrote a letter about doing something to get money out to people who were stuck in the system and not getting any money. Um, but it's, it's, it's not that I would do much different around COVID. It's much more around the broader underlying issues of income inequality, the climate crisis, where do we invest in our state to build our way out of this with better broadband for both the rural kids and teachers that have terrible education right now through remote learning, uh, as well as that hopefully being a climate crisis mitigation issue where people could commute less by working at home more and getting paid better through jobs that telecommute, uh, even down to Boston, you know, where we are in Vermont, we don't have a big city, as I mentioned earlier, but we're pretty close to Boston, New York, Connecticut, so if we had better broadband, folks with good paying software jobs or accounting jobs and marketing jobs, they could all live in Vermont, raise their families here, be a part of the Vermont fabric and have clients two and three hours away that they could visit every six or eight weeks. So that's some of the economic development tools to try to say, let's rebuild our rural communities. Let's help our small schools keep enough kids. Uh, let's help those small towns have enough people with enough money to have a local store, which have been closing. You know, we need to relocalize the economy. And uh, so those are some of the things where the difference between a reasonable Republican, he is no Donald Trump type Republican, and I thank him for that, but he is not visionary. He's very much coast through the good times and will deal with crises when they come. And I think the difference between that and my administration would be, let's be building for a better future. Let's be investing in our people. Let's be investing in our state colleges so that kids can 
get a decent education and get a better job. Those yeah. are going to be the issues. I wanted to speak to you a little bit about the education issue and, and also the matter of broadband, which you've brought up a number of times. Gavin and I on the podcast have talked about the need to make a broadband a, a universal utility, not something that is hoarded by private corporations and cartel style divvied up across the country, but rather something that is, you know, something like electricity where we put a, a public national initiative to make sure that every single American in the country has access to broadband. Uh, could you talk about how that would provide uh, better access to uh, education, job opportunities, and is that something that you would support, uh, you know, making broadband a utility and, and something that we consider like electricity? Yeah, in Vermont, we actually passed some legislation a year ago to create communication union districts, which is a, um, a new multi-town municipal area that the local towns could vote to join. So there'd be a large enough um, sort of a municipal telecommunications utility around broadband that could then access uh, low and, and almost no interest bonding uh, for installing broadband could tap into the federal resources that match broadband resources. We have one of these already in Vermont, and they've got some great high-speed internet into some pretty rural areas of Vermont with that mentality of our goal is to get access and high-speed quality access to every corner of Vermont, which is a very rural state and very spread out state. And one policy that I have been talking about since before I was even running for governor was a, a Green Mountain New Deal, Vermont's the Green Mountain State. So we adjusted Green New Deal to Green Mountain New Deal. And my proposal was to sequester about half of the Trump tax cuts to the wealthiest 5% of Vermont, which would amount to about 120 to $125 million a year for the duration of the Trump tax cuts and put that money, maybe 20 million a year into broadband, 20 million a year into weatherizing working families' homes and fixed income seniors' homes, uh, solarizing a number of working families' homes as well. These are all jobs that everyday people could do. They could get decent pay while they're doing it. We would be helping people save money on their utilities, we'd be expanding education and business opportunities for working people in rural areas, and we'd be tackling the climate crisis. So it's something that would be a full package of all those things. So specifically to broadband, yeah, I've mentioned the rural electrification project and rural telecommunications as perfect examples of where the capitalist model does not work and government needs to be a part of making sure everybody has access to those resources because they are the economic equalizer. And back then it was phones and electricity, uh, roads and highways have been, were a national investment for the economy and broadband is really one of those next things that has to be to everybody's home. Absolutely. Uh, well, another thing we wanted to ask you about was uh, we saw you received Bernie Sanders endorsement, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, Bernie really inspired me and I think Zach as well. Obviously, with his 2016 run, showed a lot of people that, uh, you know, there's a different way to approach politics, especially in the Democratic Party, which we've kind of seen, uh, you know, really um, stuck it's in its ways lately. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the neoliberal order that took over while ago is really since calcified, I think, and he, you know, showed us a way without corruption. Um, can you uh, speak a little bit about how you initially met Bernie and uh, yeah. how your campaign came to receive his blessing? Well, I've uh, been very fortunate to have seen Bernie speak back in 1992 when I was a student at UVM. So I was 21 years old, so I don't know how old you guys are, but 22. he was, there you go, right? I mean, he was incredibly inspiring to me as um, I was cynical about electoral politics, too much corporate money. Uh, a lot of politicians were, you know, finger to the wind, kind of, oh, I'll go this way now and I'll go that way then. And he just said, here, this is what I believe, right on my sleeve. One, two, three, take it or leave it, but you're going to get what you're going to get. And I'm going to be straightforward about it. And I'm not taking corporate money. And to me, as someone who was an activist on campus, particularly around environmental and some other uh, social justice issues, um, I thought, wow, you can be in that level of office and still hold your values as true as this guy is. That's, that's incredible. So I volunteered on his campaign, um, registered with a team of others, but I was the main coordinator on campus, over a thousand students to vote that fall, which was a pretty big number for school campus, you know, voting. And um, through that, I met local folks involved with what was then called the Progressive Coalition. Uh, those are folks that in their daily lives worked in affordable housing, worked in environmental issues, trying to reduce pesticides and herbicides on public you know, parks and lands, uh, worked on livable wage campaigns back then. 
and saw that people could live and work in their um, social values direction and that they were building this coalition in Burlington to challenge the two major parties. And I got involved in some of their campaigns and was asked to run in 94 as a nearly finishing senior at UVM. I lost uh, by 59 votes. And then I ran again in 96. And, and Bernie endorsed me in all of those races. So I've been oh, lucky wow. enough to have been endorsed by Bernie maybe more times than anybody else in the country, which maybe I should tout more, you know. But uh, yeah. we have a fun picture on a postcard from uh, he and I with arm around each other when I was a student. Yeah. And uh, he and I around each other from just a couple of years ago at a, at a parade in Essex Junction. And um, I feel really lucky to have him as my mentor, mostly by watching what he does. It's not yeah. like we meet regularly and he right. teaches me things. But just sure. watching him focus on the issues, focus on economic inequality and how that is so interrelated to the other social and environmental injustices that are going on. Um, has really has been inspiring to me for sure. Well, and his, as someone and, who's worked with him, oh, go ahead, Gavin. Oh, you're, I was going to say he's, I mean, one of the most popular politicians in the country, if not the most popular politician. He's won re-election resoundingly over and over again. Uh, that has to give you a pretty decent leg up, even though you're uh, an insurgent candidate. If I'm, is that correct? Yeah, you know, it's um, right now our governor is one of the more popular governors in the country, even though he's a Republican in a progressive Democrat state. Uh, he has. Um, taken a few actions and said a lot of things that have, have enamored him to uh, a fair number of Democrats to support him. He's also pissed off some of the more conservative Republicans. Um, more recently, you know, he's taken some actions, vetoing some bills that's putting those things in question. But he's very adept at uh, words that distance himself from Trump, which is not a very high hurdle to do. But he doesn't. But he doesn't take on Trump. He hasn't said. Hey, Mitch McConnell, Donald Trump, pass the HEROES Act. Help working people get through this. Help municipalities and states get through this so we don't have to cut you know, services and programs for our people. He won't challenge the president the way that he should, but he does gently distance himself so he's walking a fine line so the Republican Party will still back him as the Republican Governors Association, uh, but where moderates and even some liberals go well you know he's not so bad because and um and that makes it an uphill battle it is very winnable though because uh as a farmer i resonate more so with some of the rural population than a typical um liberal might i'm also a progressive which sometimes resonates more with some of those rural people because it's about economic inequity uh while supporting many of the liberal issues but really highlighting the economic struggle that people are facing and so it's that same thing you see play at the national dynamic where the more urban folks and the rural folks are pretty on board. And it's that suburban, better off belt that's, uh, you know, worried that if we get too progressive, um, their, their economic circumstance might get uh, um, injured. And, you know, it's not going to. When you look historically at the economic realities, when working people have more money in their pocket, the middle class actually grows. Um, but that's that that information has been so distorted by Reaganomics and the neoliberal conversation that they believe they're going to be hurt if working people do better. Yeah, one of the things Gavin and I have been really hammering on our show is the need for the left to reinvest in uh, agrarian politics in a way that makes the left politics welcoming to farmers. And, you know, uh, we briefly before the show mentioned Thomas Frank, and, you know, he makes that point tremendously with his most recent book, The People Know, where he talks about the uh, progressive populist party and the roots with the farmers and the People's Party in Kansas. And as you said, there is a hi history also of, you know, farmers being economically um, progressive. I just wonder, what do you think uh, would be some progressive uh, proposals to meet uh, that mark where we can uh, bring in some of those uh, agrarian voters to the left, to the progressive? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think there's a number of factors. One is our whole food system is, is you know, tailored after World War II to be a cheap food policy because if people have access to food and they're not hungry, they're less likely to push back against the powers that be. When you look at most uprisings around the world, it's around natural resources and food and water and basic needs that people have. So when government creates a cheap food policy, they help keep people uh, satiated, even if it's sort of a false 
sense of health and so forth. I mean, much of the food that is so cheap is also not exactly particularly healthy. So part of it is we have to look at agricultural subsidies and really how are they utilized? You know, could we move more money into the hands of working people who buy the food to increase the demand for better food? And that better food is what's grown locally and more diversified on farms and help local farms diversify. Here in Vermont, we are the most single commodity dependent state in the country. Dairy is still about 70% of our agricultural output. No other state is over 50% in any one particular product. We produce, 95% of the milk we produce goes out of state. I happen to think we could get a better price for that milk if we moved it out of the commodity market, which has been killing the small dairy farms for the last five years, and into a Vermont branded milk where from through a cooperative state supported process, we could have Vermont milk in Boston, New York, and Connecticut, and New Jersey. And we only need 5% of the population to buy our milk at a slight premium to really help our farmers in our dairy industry. Now, they're somewhat reticent to do that because they're not, they've been, they've been moved into thinking that government programs are bad. And yet when you look at how much the industry is supported by government programs, there's just a real disconnect there. So I'd like to see some adjustments there. We also need to really invest in cooperative processing and cooperative storage of food in Vermont. A lot of the smaller vegetable farms, ours is closer to 20 acres, which by national standards and out your way standards is small. By Vermont standards, I'm in the top 5% of, uh, of diversified farms in the state. We have storage for 100 to 120,000 pounds of food in four different storage rooms. Most of the farms grow an acre or two, and they just have small little three by six foot rooms with a, something called a cool bot to keep it cool in the summer, but they don't have any storage. But to build that storage for some of those farms is too expensive. So let's build cooperative storage systems throughout the state so we can grow more food locally, store it locally, and feed people for more of the year. Those farms have the equipment and the knowledge and the land to grow more and be better off economically, but they don't have the processing or the storage. So there's little pinch points that we could address um, to, to help support the expansion of diversified farming in Vermont, support our, our dairy farmers to be able to produce milk at a better price, which means they could not push their cows as hard and go to bigger and bigger scale. So there's some of those kinds of things. Is there yeah. a movement of farmers in Vermont looking to do that sort of thing? Well, on the diversified farm side, we've seen a huge explosion. Uh, and I also talked to someone the other day who is um, from Georgia, who's looking to invest 5 to $50 million to help create a regenerative agriculture network in Vermont that would then expand to New England and New York for feeding New England and New York. Uh, and so... There's a lot of young farmers who want to use agriculture as a means to sequester carbon and tackle a climate crisis, as well as feed people locally and stop the continued situation that we have of the average piece of food on your plate traveling 12 to 1500 miles. Uh, yeah. As long as we continue to do that, we will continue to have environmental consequences and CAFOs and some of the other issues that have led to cheap food, but not great animal welfare not great land management uh, and not much land diversity as far as habitat for wild animals and creatures. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on your head with, uh, you know, the increasing consolidation. It's, it's not good for anyone except for, you know, the people making the money at the top. It's the increased consolidation is bad for, you know, the workers who get increasingly lower wages on farms and are increasingly uh, exploited. It's worse for the animal welfare standards. Uh, it's worse for the communities who increasingly have to shop at places like Walmart for their uh, food, which, as you alluded to, is increasingly uh, low quality. So thank you for speaking to that. And uh, also when it comes to farming in Vermont, um, there's cannabis. And I know that in 2014, you introduced legislation that would allow for the recreational sale and use of cannabis. Uh, what's the legality status right now regarding that? And uh, do you have any plans of governor, if elected governor, to address the situation? Uh, yeah, I actually started talking about cannabis legislation in my first campaign in 1994. So I've been working on cannabis reform in Vermont for 25 years, and it has been a long slog. Uh, I'll give you the brief history version, but in 2003, I actually helped get uh, the first medical cannabis law passed through a legislature in the country through a Republican House that I was serving in, 
uh, the Democratic Senate, and it became law without the Republican governor's signature, but he let it become law. He could have vetoed the bill. Uh, so that was actually something I feel is a pretty big hallmark of the ability to work across the aisle uh, as a progressive member of the House, getting it through a Republican chamber, yeah. Democratic House and Republican governor. And then we moved our medical cannabis system to be uh, allowed for wider use of different ailments. And then we created a dispensary system, which has got its flaws, but at least there's production now. So people don't have to go underground to get it, even though they could legally have it. Yeah. And a few years back, we decriminalized it. And then a couple of years back, uh, it is now legal for people to grow two adult plants and I believe four immature plants uh, at a time for their own personal consumption. So we have that sort of libertarian Washington DC model. The problem with that is that's a very um, white and wealth system mm -hmm. because if you have to rent your apartment or you don't have land, where are you supposed to grow it? And so typically white people own more land, uh, white people have more space um, in their houses and so forth. So I would like to see us continue down the path and finish with the tax and regulate system. I happen to think Vermont could really situate itself in the craft cannabis market, uh, given that in the underground market, Vermont, um, Colorado, uh, Humboldt area, Northern California, Washington State, there's a few places in the country that already have a name for themselves in the massive underground market that much of this country seems to think doesn't even exist, which is just a fallacy. And we could in Vermont, uh, again, just like we've done with craft beer, I don't know if you all know about some of Vermont's beer industry, but it's great craft beer industry in Vermont. You know, we're not going to compete with Budweiser. We're not going to compete with a state that allows people to grow, you know, 30 acres of, you know, well, you're not going to get high quality cannabis for THC if you're growing 30 acres anyway. But we, we have high quality growers here, many of whom have left for Colorado and other states. but we have an opportunity here to do craft cannabis, and I would very much work to do that, uh, again, to help rebuild the rural economy as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've been pushing that. Obviously, we're uh, uh, recording this out of Missouri, which has, you know, uh, Kansas City went ahead and recently legalized um, medical. and uh, Missouri has a state legalized medical, and you know, Kansas City's recently decriminalized. But as a state, there have been a, a lot of hurdles for getting yeah. Uh, equal access ago. to cannabis. Yeah, two years ago, we did, we voted to decriminalize, and uh, still people are not able to buy, I mean, medicinally, at least. We legalize medicinally, and people still aren't able to actually, uh, you know, go through the process to buy. I think there's a bunch of dispensaries that are just waiting to get the, you know, go-ahead, basically, from the government. So it seems insane that, you know, they're just kind of holding it up when it's, you know, medicine for right. people. Or While Philip Morris is buying up all kinds of equity and yeah. uh, the, you know, new marijuana hot market, so in five or ten years, they can have a monopoly when they do decide it's, to legalize cannabis. It's the same story over and over, and of course, a lot of these political folks and you know, older generations, they lived with 80 years of propaganda, reefer madness and all this stuff. Uh, you know, for anybody out there that's not really sure about it, you could uh, look up The Emperor Wears No Clothes by Jack Herrer. Uh, go watch Reefer Madness, which was a movie made in the 30s that really demonized and again, xenophobically just racified Mexicans. Yeah, marijuana as it's, it's a marijuana it's is a, a racist term. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it used to be Cannabis known as hemp. Call it. Uh, and so I often, I try to be very careful about my language. I call it the underground or the illicit market rather than the black market, um, which originally didn't necessarily come from black and white and racism. But I just think given the age we're in, calling it the black market perpetuates that as well. Um, so, I mean, a lot of the reasons to legalize it are around our criminal injustice system. It's around this, the war on drugs, which was promulgated by Nixon in the early 70s to actually incarcerate anti-war movement folks, as well as the uh, civil rights movement. So cannabis was a key piece of the start of the war on drugs, which has led to our, you know, top in the world rate of incarceration, which is an incredibly racist piece of our uh, governmental system and our systemic racism. So these issues are so interrelated and in our fabric of our society, and most people just don't even know it or see it. Right. You've been, you know, working and pushing these progressive issues for a long time. Obviously, you said you met Bernie Sanders and worked with him for the first time in the early 90s. Uh, there would have been a long, hard road between then and the 2016 elections. You know, you would have gone through Clinton and Bush and, you know, all of Obama. Um, were you surprised to see just how crazily his campaign caught on? I mean, it was like wildfire. 
uh, with young people. D were you surprised? Were, were you something, was it something that you always knew was coming? Um, well, certainly I, I, I never knew that him running for president was coming. That was certainly, uh, you know, the fact that he got as far as he got, the fact that I'm running for governor, these things are widely uh, sort of surprising that we've gotten to a place where this is possible. And in some ways, I think that shows how far this country has come and what the possibilities are in the future for others to carry the mantle beyond where he is, beyond where I may carry it and so forth, because we're moving in the right direction. We're at this really steep tipping point where we could either go horribly wrong by reelecting this president and basically going over the edge of complete oligarchy and authoritarianism and a destruction of both our society as a whole, our economic system as a whole, and our, frankly, probably our democracy if this guy's president for four more years. So we could tip that way. And certainly Biden is not exactly tipping the other way as far as a strong progressive direction, but we'll at least thwart being out the other direction. We'll stay at the tipping point as opposed to going over it if we, real, if we get Biden into office. But we are still going to be on this precipice for the next few years. And what we do at the state and local level and build in Congress is going to be the real question of, can we tip the other way and have a society that's based on, you know, economic justice for people, racial and social economic justice, um, climate crisis justice. And so was I surprised in 16 that he took off? I will actually say no. When people would ask me um, in different parts of, the, you know, legislators that I knew from around the country, like, who's this Bernie guy? And, isn't he kind of cranky and angry and crazy? Like, wow, what's going to happen with him? I said, you know what? Bernie Sanders does better in rural Vermont than almost any Democrat ever has. Bernie Sanders does better with young people than almost any Democrat ever does. Bernie inspires people because of his authenticity, his integrity, and that he's fighting for these issues that are all there, but most of the political class won't talk about. And he's going to do better than you think. Now, did I expect him to do as well as he did? Not quite, because uh, frankly, I think he, su he surprised the, the national Democratic money establishment more than they had expected. They thought he was just a cranky old coot yeah. and that that would lose it for him. Um, so I do think he went farther than I thought he would. And I was admittedly disappointed this campaign cycle when uh, the progressive vote really got split quite a bit from, uh, you know, the Democratic Party is very masterful. They put up a number of people to split the vote off. And then, oh, yeah. then they and circled the wagons. stabbed in the back by his own, you know, political ally. I mean, there well, was a I, lot of... I'm not going to go there because I've got to be more diplomatic. Sure, but, I understand. Um, but the, the party very, very deftly circled the wagons in that one week oh, or yeah. four days. Um, and that brutal. was very disappointing because I think fine. Biden hopefully will win. I, I will say that straight up. I, I do not want Trump to win. I think people should vote for Biden um, because the, the alternative is just too bad. It, it is truly will destroy this country. Um, but uh, it was highly disappointing to me. I think it'll be a much closer race than it's showing to be right now. Yeah. Uh, and the inspiration, the people that really are fired up for change are just not that fired up about this this choice and Bernie would have brought far more people out of the woodworks would have engaged them in the political process and would have kept them in the political process long after the election. And that's one of the things I've learned from him is so what if I get into office? I mean, I obviously want to get into office. My ability to govern this state well and get good policies passed will be in collaboration with Vermonters and working with Vermonters all across the state on that agenda, making sure they are supportive every step of the way because that's what gets the legislators to vote and do the right thing. Every progressive piece of legislation I've ever worked on and gotten passed, some of them have taken six, eight, 12, 15 cannabis, still working on it, 25 years. Yeah. They pass because if we go into people's living rooms, local town coffee shops, library meeting rooms, church basements, meet with the community, that community then works on their respective represent representatives and senators. That's what gives clout to the work I've done in the state house. It's not through inside the state house wheelings and dealings. It's through the grassroots pressure that those legislators know they've got to now be on their game more because their people are watching. And that's the one foot inside, one foot outside that I've learned from Bernie that I've done for my whole time in the legislature, which is why I am now running and able to run for governor, why I was able to win the lieutenant governor primary four years ago 
when I wasn't the party picked candidate, was able to win a Senate seat eight years ago when I wasn't a state Senate, when I wasn't the party picked wanted, you know, wanted candidate, because when you get the people behind you, you can win over uh, the establishment. And, you know, it's an issue at the national level. I think the big issue for Bernie was to, to win over enough people versus so many powerful establishments. That's, that's hard. And that's where I think people all across the country, anybody watching this, you've got to build from the ground up, run for local office, get elected on that scale where you can win by going door to door. Obviously more difficult during COVID, bring a six foot stick when you tap on each door. But, um, but you got to win locally. you got to govern well. It's not just about our big slogans. It's actually, once you're in office, you've got to govern well. You've got to improve people's lives. You've got to clean up the streets. You've got to make that education more accessible for everybody. You've got to open up the doors of economic opportunity for small entrepreneurs of, of different races and ethnicities. You've got to help people's lives get better. And that's how you build the credibility to get to higher and higher office. Well, I had one more uh, question for you uh, regarding Vermont. And, uh, you know, this is something that was a fact that was weaponized against Bernie and his, you know, plans for Medicare for all, his proposal. Uh, and that's the fact that, you know, Vermont, in I believe 2011, tried unsuccessfully to transition to a single payer healthcare system. Would you mind just speaking to that a little bit and maybe clearing up the air on what exactly happened in Vermont? Sure. Uh, you know, the details are always going to be murky, but uh, the reality is we passed the law. The law was being implemented. And at the last minute, the governor uh, said, you know what? The payroll tax is going to be too high. Uh, I just can't do it. And I think there are two factors that went into the challenge here. One is that when we implemented Obamacare in Vermont, it was the administration's goal in a good way to make sure the database of the Affordable Care Act really set ourselves up for a universal health care system. The problem was some of our computer systems and some of the ideas were so archaic and mixed and com just confounded that the implementation of the Affordable Care Act went very poorly in Vermont. Yeah, pretty there bad. I remember that. A lot of computer glitches, a lot of people getting gummed up in the system. Yeah. And so yeah. that really reduced the public's faith that government could do the job well. Think so, that Bob. goes back to what I just said. You got to get into office, then you've got to govern well. Yeah. As progressives, we can't just just be saying the right things. We've got to do the right. job well, and that sometimes is forgotten. So then, because of that, there was less faith that the government could do it well. Second mm -hmm. on that was that yes, it was going to be a tax. The governor, congressman, senator uh, Bernie Sanders has always said, "Of course, there's going to be a tax, but you're going to get rid of all your premiums. You're going to eliminate." The premium, Eliminate the private much, tax. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a private tax that's far greater Pardon. than what the public tax would be for most people. And our governor got cold feet and pulled the plug at the very last minute, which is really unfortunate because it would have meant entrepreneurial opportunity for people. You know, if you no longer have to stay in your job in order to keep your health care, yeah. which could go out on a limb and start a new business because you knew you still had health care, yeah. that would have been a boon for Vermont, which is always having a hard time attracting entrepreneurs and businesses because we're not on the beaten path. We don't have a big city. Yeah. We're not between here and there. We don't have any coastline. Um, so it was a, a huge opportunity missed. And what I'd like to do if I'm governor is start towards a universal primary care system and, and implement that well and show that it works. And then we could expand it uh, beyond that. Uh, but there's no doubt that the failure in 2011 not only set it back in Vermont, but it, it set it back in other places because uh, – you know, people say, oh, look over there. Right. It, it was cold feet um, and poor implementation for sure. It seems like that was kind of by the design almost for, and, and maybe this is a cynical perspective, but it seems like all of the work by the Republicans to, you know, uh, stop any uh, eff efficacy from the, you know, Affordable Care Act and, you know, then, you know, one after blow after another kind of really uh, took out the public con uh, public uh, confidence that, you know, we sure. can deliver or something like that. I mean, certainly at the national level, you know, the, the governmental message from the Republican Party is that government can do no good. And right. the less government, the better. And the more they do, I mean, it's such an easy message because all they have to do is cause trouble. It's, it's much easier yeah. to break a machine yeah. than it is to build a machine. Yeah. And there is a difference between the two parties in that regard. Um, you know, the Democrats want government to work well, but they still want it also to protect their wealth. That is quo um, managers. Yeah, but uh, but the Republicans just want to more or less destroy it, yeah. and uh, and that's a very unfortunate and 
cynical view on their part, and I appreciate your cynical view, Zach, in that it's um, uh, that that there's some sort of uh, cabal to do that, and and I don't think our Democratic governor, who is doing single payer or or Medicare for all in Vermont, was trying to mess it up. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was some level of inability to get it done right, and that's really unfortunate. Uh, well, uh, David Zuckerman, we thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Um, we loved speaking with you. Gavin, if you had anything else to add. Uh, yeah, no, it was a great conversation, David. Thanks so much for joining us today, and we uh, wish you luck with the rest of the campaign. Well, I appreciate it. I do want to throw out my website. If Absolutely. That's okay. Absolutely. Um, Zuckerman for Vermont.com. That's Zuckerman, Z U C K E R M A N. Four is the word, F O R. And Vermont is abbreviated VT. So it's Zuckerman, F O R V T.com. And of course, anybody who watches or listens, you know, this is a no corporate donation campaign. So if anybody out there wants to give five bucks or 50 bucks, or you happen to be the one rich person watching and you want to give up to $4,160, yeah, uh, go for it. Um, we hope we have know, some whales watching. <laughs> well, you know, what's interesting about this race, because, you know, a lot of people are really focused on the U.S. Senate and the president. I mean, everything yeah. we hear about is we got to get the Senate back. Mm. Obviously, we have to get the presidency back. The Supreme Court is, is an incredibly critical thing. We're all wishing Ruth Bader Ginsburg's health for yep. another five months, uh, six months, preferably years. Um, but here's one of the interesting things about the Vermont governor's race. We do have Bernie and we have Senator Le- Patrick Leahy. They are two of the older senators. If something happens to them in these next couple of years and we continue with our Republican governor, he would appoint that replacement. Ooh. It would only be a three month appointment. Then there would be a runoff election, but that appointee would have a leg up. And so if we're talking about the balance of the U.S. Senate being True. potentially one vote, folks should consider what I'm calling the cheap date of the Vermont governor's race, which is a half a million dollar to a million dollar race compared to a $40 million Kentucky, you know, McGrath race and, you know, millions of dollars in Colorado, millions of dollars in these other yeah. races. So anybody out there that cares about the Senate, if you care about that future, a small contribution to the Vermont governor's race for me to help win it. Uh, may be a key piece of the U.S. Senate over the next few years. Excellent Knock point. on wood that our our senators stay healthy. Yeah, of but, course. <laughs> but, and there will uh, be a, a link to the website in the show notes for anybody who wants to access that to find more information. Yeah. Yeah. I apologize for going long on that, but it's a Oh, absolutely. No thing. problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much, right David. On. All right. Good talking. 